And dobro jutro. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I must congratulate HSC on the way this conference has been conducted and organized. Uh, it has been, um, to my observation, seamless, perfect. I'm sure behind the scenes it's been a lot of work and problems have arisen and been solved. But for those of us who have been invited guests, we have been looked after extremely well and we're all very grateful. Uh, and w those of us who have been coming here for some years notice also a uplift in the, in the uh, academic culture around our field of higher education studies at HSC. There's more work being done, better work being done, and the emerging scholars are playing a significant role in that. So thank you very much again for the invitation. I hope that I can do justice to it. Um, I want to talk today about uh, the difficult topic of uh, private and public uh, in higher education. There's little consensus or even understanding um, in a shared way about those concepts. First, there's no agreement about whether the, where the public-private line falls and the implications for funding. Now, there are two main concepts that are in use. In one approach, which I call the economic definition, um, public-private is understood as the distinction between non-market production and market production. In the other approach, which I call the political definition, public-private is understood as a distinction between state-controlled or non-state controlled higher education. Now each of these definitions is useful and says something important and in some respect they overlap but they're also different in their logic. Um, and they also tend to get muddled up in our talk about public and private. I mean there are those who claim see the public-private distinction as a distinction between state and market. Now, this takes public from the political definition and market from the economic de definition. Um, but to define public-private as a state-market distinction is incoherent. It doesn't work. I mean, states use markets to achieve some of their policy goals. So there can be state-controlled market production, and that's very common in education. Now, is that public or is it private? If you adopt the view that it's about state versus market, then you can put it in either side of the distinction. Um, and some higher education is both non-state and non-market, I mean, if it's philanthropically financed and, and mounted, for example. So what's that? Is that public or, or private? So the state-market distinction is the one you need to try to set aside in your mind to deal with this presentation. Now, secondly, there is no common understanding of the nature of public goods or the combined public good in higher education. We understand some of the private goods associated with higher education quite well, um, such as the contribution of degrees to additional earnings um, and better employment rates. It's not always clear whether rates of return to degrees are driven by the education or by other factors such as family background or social networks, and there's... In important work really emerging now which is saying that social background an advantage social background continues to be important right through your career but but at least we do have definitions and measures of these private goods rates of return in particular um, now we do not have agreement and definitions and measures of the public good contribution not really an opinion differs from expert to expert and country to country and there are special difficulties in dealing with the collective aspect of public goods those outcomes of higher education which don't consist of individual benefits but affect the quality of society, relational society and the economy. For example, shared social and scientific literacy, improvements in combined productivity at work, the contribution of education to furthering tolerance uh, or the combined capacity to deal with change and modernisation. Now, arguably, because a common understanding of public goods in higher education is lacking, these goods tend to be under-provided, under-recognised, under-financed perhaps especially those public goods that are not national in character but, but relate to transactions across borders. We're also unclear on whether the public goods are alternative to the private goods 
so that higher education produces either private or public, but not both, or that, all, all, all that the two are, two are produced together and can grow together. Now, at present then, we lack strong, coherent social science tools, definitions and empirical methods that will enable us to explain and track public goods in higher education. But we know this is an important problem and does get talked about quite a lot. And I don't think we should confine ourselves to research on matters that we already understand, that tell us what we already know uh, and replicate many previous studies. I mean, we should take the journey into the unknown in social research. And this is my strong belief. Uh, we should push through the wall of our ignorance in social research. I thought that was a very, very nice quote from the interviews, which I'm going to talk about later. Now, th this first half of the paper uh, will present an, a, a generic analytical approach that I've developed to the definition of public and private goods and apply it to higher education and, and research in higher education. And it's fairly new in the sense that the article was first published earlier this year. But the question of public higher education is not simply a generic worldwide theoretical matter. It also varies by nation, by political culture, and by the character of the state. Now, what is public in higher education in some countries might be private in others. Now, we need to find out what's generic and also what varies by country. And this might lead to a change in the generic definition. So I'm conducting an eight-country study of approaches to public and private goods in higher education, concepts, definitions and measures. And the national studies include interviews in government and two universities in each country. I've already conducted case studies in Russia and Australia in 2013. The next round of case studies will be UK, US, France, Finland, China and Japan. Now it's also possible the work will be extended to Germany and Mexico. Germany is almost too important to leave out, I think. We need a Latin American case but this is, will be subject to financial constraints. We've got to raise some more money for those two cases. The UK case study begins in December this year. France, uh, China and Japan next year. In the second half of the paper, I'll v present for the first time findings from the 30 interviews in Russia in 2030, half of which took place at HSC. Now, let's now look at the economic definition of public-private. This can be traced to an influential article by Paul Samuelson in 1954, The Pure Theory of Public Expenditure. Uh, simplifying, Samuelson defined public goods as non-market goods. They're socially necessary but unprofitable for businesses to produce in a market. They cannot be produced in a market because they're non-rivalrous and or non-excludable. Goods are non-rivalrous when they can be consumed by any number of people without being depleted, for example, knowledge of the mathematical theorem which sustains its use value indefinitely on the basis of free access. Goods are non-excludable when the benefits cannot be confined to individual buyers, such as clean air regulation. Private goods are neither non-rivalrous nor non-excludable. There's a range of goods that are intermediate, which I, I should give, do justice to, but I, because of the length of the presentation, I won't go into that, those elements such as club goods and merit goods and so on. Um, I'm dealing with, the, if you like, the basic Samuelson distinction. Um, now, private goods are neither non-rivalrous or non-excludable, and, so, and they can be produced, packaged and sold as individualised commodities in, in economic markets. Public goods and part public goods require government funding or philanthrop philanthropic support. They do not necessarily require full government funding, and they can be produced in either state or private institutions. Now, the economic definition is useful because it identifies the minimum necessary government action and financing. On the other hand, the notion also has limitations. Some would disagree that it's normal or desirable for goods always to, to be produced in markets unless that's impossible, because markets can change the character of the product and stratify value and distribution. They can generate tendencies to concentration and monopoly and the growth of consumption inequalities over time. And the same bias is present in the otherwise useful notion of externalities. Economists identify spillover public goods or externalities additional to the private goods, such as the contribution of market-based educational courses to greater tolerance 
or collective literacy. It mightn't have been part of the original intention in the buy-seller transaction, but it is a, is a social consequence of, of providing that education. Um, I think the idea of spillovers is good. The idea of unintended consequences is good. But the assumption is that the core production is always market production and the spillovers arise as unintended consequences of the production of market goods. So they're external, externalities, external or outside of the real transaction. But so-called externalities might be a deliberate public policy choice, in which in reality makes them internalities, if you like, in the political sense. Now, why the, while the economic distinction implies that public or private is determined by the nature of the goods, um, naturally rivalrous or excludable or not, this is often a matter of deliberate policy choice. For example, while research, with some caveats, is a natural public good, as in the case of the mathematical theorem, teaching can be either a public or a private good. Certainly student places and, and, and the passage to graduation and the credential can be understood and practised as either public or private goods. It's a choice. Um, mostly in higher education, it's a variable mix of both public and private. The public goods <coughs> include individualised non-market benefits such as the learned knowledge, which is non-excludable and non-rivalrous, which is why a great private university like MIT puts the uh, courseware on the internet for free of charge. Everyone can access it all over the world. It's non-rivalrous and non-excludable. That's, of course, the, the, the private good at MIT is the, uh, is the um, value of the diploma itself, the networking experience, uh, the relational benefits of, of studying there and so on. And that is excludable and rivalrous and it's a private good. Um, so whether, whenever university places con confer value in comparison with non-participation, there's rivalry. And in universities with a surplus of applications over places, participation is excludable. And you can have a market intuition. So teaching, student places, credentials can be either public or private. The value of such private goods is maximised in programs offering students valuable positional opportunities to enter high-income, high-status careers, such as law and medicine provided in elite universities. There's also a strong element of the normative in these questions. I mean, it depends on one's political assumptions. Neoliberal economists will tend to downplay market failure uh, and the scope for collective goods. Social democrats, endogenous growth theorists and so on will talk up the potential of public goods and state investment. So, although the Samuelson definition starts as an objective definition based on natural circumstances, it ends up being a political problem. Um, now, the Samuelson definition treats the state as outside the market economy and only brought into the picture when, when ne absolutely necessary. However, arguably, this is not a good description of how any society or any higher education system actually works. The state is more important than that suggests. This brings the political definition of public-private into the picture. This is the distinction between matters seen as public in the sense that they are ultimately shaped by government and the political and policy process, and matters seen as private and, con and as part of the commercial market, the family or civil society. And John Dewey provides one explanation of the public-private boundary in the political sense, <coughs> the distinction between matters of state and other matters. Now here, public higher education is not confined only to institutions or activities that are directly government provided or financed. Public, in the political sense, is quite broad. Um, it refers to any matter, perhaps it's too broad, too loose. Uh, it refers to any matter taken by the state as a deliberative actor with policy goals. Matters that are public in the economic sense are usually public in this political sense too, but so are many other matters. Governments often use private and semi-public agencies to achieve their goals. Public includes the kind of state intervention to regulate economic markets and private firms that goes beyond simply providing a stable legal framework. Now note here that the state is closely involved in higher education in many domains in all countries, including the United States. Uh, higher education does not necessarily stop being public in this political sense when there is competition between institutions and there are high tuition fees and so on though some market production in our sector is fully deregulated and belongs in the private political sphere as well as the private economic sphere. So we have two definitions of public and private with different meanings and both tell us something important 
the economic definition based on the non-market market distinction subjects politically defined public goods to tests of limited resources and costs. How publicly generous should higher education provision be, it asks. The political definition of public-private, which is based on the state non-state distinction, subjects economically defined public and private goods to tests of values, norms, social relations and system design. Public and collective forms of provision can change the nature of the goods, for example, their social equity. So what kind of society do you want, it says. And the response from the economic side is, well, to the extent that your preferred social arrangement is subject to market failure, government has to finance it. But is that affordable? There are other claims on public financing. But having these two separate definitions creates ambiguity and confusion. So how can we adopt a coherent approach to public and private? Well, by combining the two public and um, to, to the two public-private definitions in a matrix. Now, this replaces the ambiguous two-way distinction between public and private education with four distinct zones, four different political economies of higher education, if you like, in which higher education and research are practised in contrasting ways. And real-life higher education systems Institutions and people are usually in all four zones at some point, but the balance between them varies from case to case. In quadrant one, which I call here civil society, which is controversial, because civil society sometimes includes the market, sometimes doesn't. So I've left the market in quadrant four here, the pure market, and, uh, um, and, and, and just confined my civil society notion to the home, to various forms of non-market and non-state regulated production. Uh, in, in universities and so on. It's a non-market private zone in which free teaching and research are practised as ends in themselves, at home or at university, without government supervision or close institutional management or financing. Now, this is actually a larger zone than, than we often acknowledge. I mean, much learning and discovery takes place here, um, sometimes in adjunct or joined to the, others, the other quadrants. Um, the state is not entirely absent here, in that it regulates civil conduct in the family in the legal sense, but just as it's in quadrant four as well, where it regulates commercial transactions in the market in the legal sense. But I'm making a separation between that legal regulation and more interventionist state policy. In quadrant two, you have a strong state. Um, I call it social democracy because it's sort of Nordic quadrant. Um, production takes a non-market form, free places or low-cost uh, low fee places, as occurs in most of Europe. Well, at the same time, production is regulated directly by government. Now, how it's regulated by government, whether it's top-down, whether it's devolved, whether it's democratic or not, I mean, they're, 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 they're further questions, if you like. The point is the state's a major player here. I mean, you have a comprehensive state in the Nordic countries, you have a comprehensive state in China. I mean, they're somewhat different comprehensive states, but what they have in common is the idea that the state and the society are almost the same thing, and the, the ambit of the state is quite wide. Um, now, much of the research activity is concentrated in Quadrant 2, although not all of it. Um, in Quadrant 3, the, the uh, state quasi-market, government still shapes what happens, but it often uses market-like forms to achieve its objectives and encourages universities to operate as corporations with significant tuition fees, systems organised on the basis of students as customers, not learners, competition between universities for funds, product style research formats, a lot of competition and research and so on. A lot of league tables, a lot of hierarchies formed around these, these competitive, competitive relational transactional activities. Now this is the higher education sector imagined by global rankings, not just imagined in government, also imagined in rankings which are formally performed outside the state. Um, higher education as a managed market. <coughs> Marketisation reform in many countries has pushed an increasing part of higher education into quadrant three. Um, more, much more so than the pure commercial market in Quadrant 4. Now, in Quadrant 4, higher education is just another business, basically. Um, it's another industry. Uh, government regulates it legally, as I said, but it doesn't intervene particularly closely. Um, courses in higher education that operate on the deregulated basis of full price fees, unlimited number of student places, belong in Quadrant 4. And you might say some of the Russian higher education is in Quadrant 4. Um, and international education in the English-speaking countries, at least in the case of UK, 
Australia, New Zealand, which is a full, fully commercial industry, is, is basically in quadrant four, although it's joined to quadrant three and two forms uh, in, the, in the public university sector. Um, so a lot of continuing education and professional training is in this, takes this full fee form, unregulated by government, just to basically to, to, to raise revenues. Um, but in most systems, the pure market activity in quadrant four is overshadowed by the volume of activity in quadrants two and three. Now, you can see that teaching, research and other activities in higher education can differ in character according to where they are on the diagram. Now, real-life higher education systems mix activity in all four quadrants, as I said, but the balance varies. And so Nordic and Central European systems are strong in quadrant two, competitive Anglo-American systems pulling ever more activity into quadrant three. And the four quadrants show that there's nothing inevitable about inherited arrangements. They can change. Governments and societies can order their systems as they want. Now, the diagram also shows that there's great scope for producing public goods in either the political or the economic sense or both together through government leadership in quadrants two and three, civil and community-based organisation in quadrant one, self-regulation activity of higher education institutions in all three of quadrants one, two and three. And the pure public good quadrant is quadrant two, where production is public in both the sense of non-market and the sense of state control. The pure private quadrant is quadrant four. The fact that higher education is public does not mean that in some way it's better or more desirable. Both public in the economic sense and public in the political sense can be associated with a very wide range of normative <laughs> projects. Public goods in the economic sense can become captured by the most influential families, as in some highly selective universities in countries where tuition is free. Some public goods in the political sense might benefit powerful interests able to influence the state, or a state may use its power to create public goods to establish a globally aggressive military that creates public bads for the population of other countries and perhaps the state's own country downstream. However, there are some public goods in one or both senses that benefit populations broadly, help to build relational society or sociability and sustain inclusive and rights-based approaches to human relations. I call these goods common goods. That's my normative intervention in the discussion. Common goods, the, the idea of common goods. There are other meanings given to common goods in the literature. <coughs> there's not, but this is the meaning I give to it. Uh, they include higher education to the extent that it fosters an equitable framework of social opportunity, offers good quality mass higher education, strengthens society in regions and provincial centres, provides relational collective goods such as tolerance, cross-border international understanding, accessible knowledge. Equal social opportunity in and through higher education is perhaps the most important of such common goods on a world scale. Now, at the end of November, next month, I'm going to bring out a, a book on higher education and the common good that discusses the different kinds of public goods and argues for an increased focus on common goods to counterbalance what are becoming increasingly unequal societies in the sense of income. You can purchase either the PDF or um, the printed version at different prices. The website will give you the information. Um, here ends the commercial. Um, now, let's bring this theorisation of public-private problem into the real higher education space, which is a worldwide space. And that forces us to acknowledge two realities. First, some public goods are produced in the absence of a state, in the global sphere of activity. This is confusing and difficult, theoretically. Second, as I stated earlier, public uh, goods vary in character by country. Now, in the global sphere, only one public-private distinction can be relevant, and that's the economic distinction. There's no formal political sphere, no global state. So no doubt this leads to some under-recognition of the possible possibilities inherent in global public goods um, and the role of higher education in producing them. According to the UNDP, global public goods are goods that have a significant element of non-rivalry and or non-excludability, broadly available, no, a number of countries are involved and distribu distributed broadly within countries. One global public good is research knowledge. However, nations differ in the extent to which they contribute to and benefit from global public goods that are carried by cross-border flows of knowledge 
ideas and people and generated in education and research. For example, the content of global knowledge flows is linguistically and culturally dominated by certain countries, especially the United States. And this raises the question, whose public goods are we talking about? For faculty whose first language is Russian, having English as the single common global language is a public good in the sense that it facilitates a relational environment, it means we can all talk to each other in, in, in academic journals, um, but it's a public bad, if you like, a negative global public good, to the extent that it marginalises knowledge in the Russian language at global level and devalues Russian at home, for example, in local science communities. And this is also the case for the uh, large amount of scholarship in Spanish, Portuguese, German and so on, Japanese and, you know, all the other major languages. Um, so the relational environment carries, in, carries with it both global goods and, and global bads. A net brain drain of research personnel to other countries is arguably another global public bad, although there's usually some kickback in terms of, of, of greater um, engagement with, um, with those other countries. Now, countries may vary in their political cultures, how broad is the reach of the state, and whether its responsibilities are practised as comprehensive or limited, and how egalitarian the higher education system is expected to be. But we need to understand why they vary. These differences closely influence the political understanding of public or private in all sectors, and also affect the way the economic distinction is interpreted by policymakers as well. And these differences affect the quadrant locations of production in higher education. Now, let me now turn to the case of Russia and public goods in higher education. How did the 30 interviewees see it in 2013? Maybe if you do the interviews today, they, the answers will be slightly different. They, they, they're always conditioned by the times, but um, I'm sure most of the answers will be similar. Um, I conducted five interviews in, in government um, among personnel responsible for higher education matters. Eight interviews in MISIS, which is, as you know, is high quality engineering specialist universities with its focus on metallurgy, and 17 interviews at HSC. I'm very grateful to HSC for facilitating this project, and of course, the high level of international engagement of people in HSC made, it, made those interviews much richer. Um, the HEC interviews included a range of disciplines, um, social science, humanities, mathematics, engineering, and also university leaders. I will reflect on some of the findings from those interviews now. Now, after the biographical preliminary, the interviews normally began with the role of government in higher education, and there were two distinct strands of discussion, often associated with two different understandings of the public good in higher education. And sometimes individuals move from strand to strand during the, the interview, but mostly they answered consistently in terms of one strand or the other. Now, in the first strand was especially strong at Mrs., but also evident at HSC. And here, people discussed the role of government in terms, I think, resembling the Soviet model. They located higher education as economically public and politically public, quadrant two. In Soviet times, government planned the economy, or tried to, and, and education in the short term and long term. It worked out how many specialists would be required in each category. It allocated student places accordingly. It funded and controlled higher education closely, and then it later allocated graduates to jobs. Now, when thinking in terms of the Soviet style of government in higher education, interviewees called up all of that picture. <clears throat> they said that government should provide stable conditions of work for faculty and researchers, and several recalled with nostalgia the modest but adequate salaries of scientists in Soviet time and the respect in which scientists were held in Soviet time. Of course, government no longer directly allocates graduates to jobs, so here the interviewees who were in this mindset basically called on government to take action that would bring universities closer together with employers. Not very clear what that action would be, and it was recognised this was a problem area. However, the problem with, the, with this model is that now, while government officials still see themselves as powerful, responsible, funding and controlling higher education, these days they're also short-term, rather than long-term in their thinking, happy to devolve labour market responsibilities to higher education rather than keep those responsibilities in government and unable to fund adequate salaries or to guarantee stable conditions of the, of the, of the earlier type for good quality scientists. A post-Soviet strand was also evident. 
And in these answers, interviewees wanted deregulation, a lesser role for government. It was quite clear that, this, that the difference turned around the nature and the valuation of the state. Um, they were somewhat prepared to argue for less role of government, even if it meant getting less money. And in this, in this mindset, government was not seen as always everywhere. Some talked about government as being just another stakeholder. There was criticism of government financial control, of the selection of rectors, of concerns about, and there were concerns about intervention and curriculum and teaching, in curriculum and teaching, and, and a number of people referred to this. These um, interviewees tended to talk in terms of market model. Um, they put more of higher education in quadrants three and four than did the other strand. They favoured an economic rather than a political definition of public good. And they argued that government should fund higher education, especially in those areas clearly subject to market failure. They were inclined to talk about externalities uh, rather than about public goods. Still, some of the same interviewees also acknowledged that the private sector was unable or unwilling to fund higher education at the necessary scale and universally high tuition fees in higher education would reduce participation among students from poor families. In other words, there wasn't a clear-cut road forward for the post-Soviet model either. Um, so these two different strands of thought neatly sum up the continuing fracture in the political culture, which you're all, I'm so, so aware of, between the 1980s Soviet view of the world and the market liberal post-Soviet view, which emerged with such, emerged with such astounding rapidi rapidity in the 1990s, but then was unable to fully transform the political culture or constitute a stable society and economy in its, own, in its own right. Both strands run through Russian society and are installed side by side in higher education, neatly symbolised by the split tuition system and the differing idea of public goods that are in, is entailed. The relationship between Soviet model and post-Soviet idea is essentially, I think, non-dialectical. That is, that they're really heterogeneous in different worlds. You can't just put them together and get a nice, neat synthesis out of it. Um, on one hand, you've got the publicly supported places, mostly in STEM, um, positioning students for the old military industrial economy. Sometimes in the regions, the, um, the uh, employing agencies are shutting down, and yet the institutions are still pumping out those kinds of graduates. Um, this is associated with a broad-based, comprehensive and solely political idea of the public good. On the other hand, there's the market-driven places, mostly preparing students for post-Soviet new economy in uh, business, law, communications and so on, associated with a more limited and specifically economic idea of the public good with lesser expectations of funding um, from government and often full-price tuition operating. And what's interesting about the way Russian higher education has evolved is how those two strands in the system, in the tuition structure and so on, are quite neatly balanced, as if the whole country is holding in suspension the question of where it's going. In other words, the transition continues, uh, and the question transition to what is not yet resolved. Um, now, some Mrs. students combine engineering um, degrees with economics degrees, which is sort of playing both sides of the of the of the equation, um, preparing for both kinds of Russia, if you like, and that's probably a very sensible thing to do. It was also interesting that sometimes interviewees, in their thinking, combine both strands. I call this hybrid thinking trying to get to grips with these two contrary um, sets of practices, uh, trying to put them together in some way. In this, as in the case of the quote, where the thinking starts with the post-Soviet model, essentially, and also goes on to suggest a broader idea of the public good might be necessary to explain the role of higher education. Hybrid thinking is an important resource. I mean, un until the respective political cultures of the 1980s and 1990s are absorbed into something that transcends both, uh, there can be no clear way forward, no consensus about the nature of higher education and the tuition structure. But, of course, this is a larger problem than just higher education. Interviewees had many ideas about public goods in higher education, and I cannot do full justice to them here. <coughs> it was pointed out that the possible public goods vary by time and place. They also vary by discipline, by the size, the status and the resources of the institution, whether it has large-scale research or not, uh, and, there is possibly, and there's possibly greater potential for public goods in the regions, in the sense that at least it's easy to recognise 
what higher education institutions do for the public good in the regions than it is in a city the size of Moscow. Uh, and there's quite a lot of data on regional variation and, and the role of higher education in building regions, which I think I will use in another paper. Um, some HSC interviewees discussed the extensive role of HSC in government policy making and consultancy advice, while also noting that this role wasn't broadly available across the higher education system. This was a particular historical characteristic of HSC that had achieved this, this, this important function. Uh, at Mrs. the role in relation to government was simply seen as providing high quality leaders for government, um, ministers and so on, uh, leading officials who, who were graduates of Mrs. And almost every uh, interviewee I interviewed at Mrs. said the same thing <coughs> about the role of Mrs. in producing graduates for leadership positions and named the people concerned who were in senior leadership positions. Um, interviewees made the point that some public goods such as museums are not free. Um, it's not a question, you don't determine whether something's public or private by whether it has a price. And in fact, higher education has never been free. Uh, it was always paid for by the student or the taxpayer. Um, um, when the state pays, the resources come from the society after all. Um, some also pointed out that many public goods in higher education are created whether or not tuition fees are charged. Even in high tuition fee regimes, Though some public goods are reduced by high tuition fees, for example, equity so in social access. Now, those comments, I think, have the effect of weakening the nexus between the public-private distinction in economic theory and the financing arrangements. Um, I think the, the notion that you can derive financing arrangements from the assumptions about the public-private mix of activity probably probably pretty shaky, I think. Um, Though two of, the, the two of the economists who were interviewed did firmly hold to the view that you could determine the fee structure really solely in terms of assumptions about public and private. The discussion of collective goods also placed the orthodox economic definition in question. And it became clear again and again in the interviews that many that, 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 that there, it was believed that there were extensive collective goods created by higher <coughs> education. And this was coming really from both strands of the discussion. Um, Interviewees noted uh, the long-term importance of higher education institutions in providing public available expertise in all disciplines as a kind of resource across the broad range of knowledge for any social need or problem that might arise in the future. Um, although it was pointed out wryly by the humanists that actually the STEM disciplines are funded to do this better than we are. Um, but humanists always say that, I must say, in every system, and they're also right in every system. Um, and uh, the, the idea that of, of, of universities as an open source of information and ideas and knowledge and information and better cultural life was sort of like seeing universities in the same terms as um, a society-wide library or a museum. I mean, one interviewee talked about the sociability of knowledge. For many interviewees, this public role of higher education in knowledge and communications, which in part seemed to be derived from the sort of Soviet-era picture, of the role of, of universities, was explicitly grounded in the public good nature of knowledge. One interviewee also discussed the higher education system as fostering critical thought and argued that this improved cross, the capacity in cross-cultural relations. And a lot of people, I'd say half a dozen of the interviewees at least, mentioned um, the contribution of higher education to furthering tolerance between different kinds of people, especially from people from different regions in, the, in, the, uh, in Russia. Um, we must live together as brothers or perish together as fools, as one of the interviewees said. Um, interviewees also referred to the value of higher education in social and economic modernisation. It was interesting that there wasn't much discussion of the role of higher education in fostering national economic competitiveness, though arguably that's <coughs> clearly a public good role in both the economic and political sense. Or, nor was there much discussion of the contribution of higher education to economic prosperity in general, which government would see as a central role of higher education in, 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 in the public good sense. I think this is probably because, because people generally separate in their mind those sorts of the building of a profitable, um, capitalist, high growth capitalist economy as a sort of separate from the public goods problem. Um, but I'm not sure that's right. I mean, the main thing that people discussed in, this, in that regard was preparation of graduates for work. But they discussed that in terms of the individual skills of graduates more than their contribution to productivity. I thought that was quite interesting. I thought there'd be a stronger emphasis on the economic benefits of the system. Um, 
People in both strands argue that government should uh, guarantee human rights as a common good, uh, and one of the essential roles of government was to ensure that students from all backgrounds had opportunities to enter higher education. There's a, some discussion <coughs> of higher education's role in furthering uh, and fostering social mobility. However, the emphasis on higher education's role in providing for participation on an inclusive basis and equal opportunity received less discussion than I had expected. This is because it's such a strong theme in these kinds of interviews in most countries. The equity participation agenda is probably the main public good that gets discussed when you talk about public goods. But that is not the case in Russia. The reason I assume is that um, Russia has had high participation since the 1990s and this has become firmly associated with poor quality mass higher education, credentialism, low levels of learning and graduates who clearly aren't going to use their higher education in the workplace. These issues were frequently discussed by interviewees. They were, they're clearly deeply felt. Um, there was no question in my list of questions on this topic, but it arose in the majority of interviews anyway. Some suggested that it should be a mandatory responsibility of government to monitor, improve and manage standards of curriculum and student learning, though two HSC interviews, interviewees had a, a, more, a developed argument that um, this kind of regulation should be by professional associations and not by, directly by the state, by the ministry. Now, the negatives about the outcomes of massification and the low levels of reference to equality issues suggest that in this respect, there has been a break with the affirmative action empire, um, as the Soviet era was called in one book uh, that um, Isaac mentioned to me, um, in which the, in, in, the equal distribution of opportunities, particularly among regions, was an important uh, principle of state. That principle is no longer as deeply felt, at least in the higher education system at the present. Now, given that Russian higher education is not as internationalised as are most European and East Asian <coughs> systems, there was a surprising emphasis, I thought, on the, its role in creating glo open global public goods, um, which was seen primarily as centred in exchange of knowledge and research information. However, only one interviewee discussed the idea of um, preparation for global citizenship in teaching programs. So it was mainly global public goods were talked about in terms of knowledge and research. Several interviewees just stated that Russia contributed to higher education in other countries through brain drain, which of course is quite correct. Um, and that was seen as both a public good for the other countries and a public bad for Russia. One HSE sociologist also developed an argument that for Russia, globalisation in higher education also meant Americanisation. So those issues came up, but the primary emphasis was on research exchange. Um, this reminds us, I think, that global public goods and national public goods can be in tension. Um, however, Russian government and higher education tend to sidestep the national global tensions problem, which are an inevitable part of global engagement in all countries, by minimising global engagement. Now, HSC does not do this, and it's much more internationalised than most institutions. And this allowed my interviewees to generalise freely about the semi-closed nature of Russian higher education. And the government officials made the same point about the system being largely closed internationally, although they had no constructive suggestions <coughs> on how to help the sector to engage more effectively across borders. Um, the view of the academic interviewees was that government might say it's committed to internationalisation, but it doesn't do anything about it. For their part, the government officials just flick the responsibility back to the higher education institutions. So that's not going anywhere at the moment. It's just going back and forth. One would not expect interviewees to come up with firm and cogent proposals for the measurement of public goods in higher education. It's a difficult problem. The, the Mrs. interviewees were not greatly interested in this question. But at HSC, several interviewees tackled it fairly uh, extensively, talking about element, um, ideas such as tracking and measuring the impact of higher education on graduate skills, on individual graduates, on graduate career trajectories, on graduate personality and attributes, on graduate values, and so on. And, of course, the more conventional studies, longitudinal studies of graduate um, salaries and, and employability. The main challenge is how to observe and track the larger collective goods discussed in the interviews. Qualities such as knowledge flows and tolerance and social equity can be tracked and measured only in part using individual indicators, never really in a holistic sense. 
However, the many references to collective goods underline the point I made earlier, uh, the absence of such techniques um, for observing and understanding the larger scale public goods leaves a large hole in our definitions and measures of the outcomes of higher education. There's much more activity in quadrants one and two particularly than economists can, can readily identify with their <coughs> precise uh, and uh, clear cut observational tools. Um, now this collective activity isn't simply reducible to spillovers from private transactions. Um, colleagues, uh, I've reached the end of my speaking time, I think, um, more, more than done so. I sincerely thank you for your patience with the English language speaker. I thank Alexander and the interpreters very sincerely for their effort. I know how hard your job is and I really appreciate the way you go about it. Um, I look forward to the brief discussion. Let me just close by reiterating the two main points that I've made. Now, when planning and observing the public and social relational dimension of higher education, we need to take both the market non market distinction and the non state state distinction into account. Now, both are relevant and they need to be arranged in a coherent fashion. At present, as in other countries, the Russian understanding is split between the two approaches. This is a good example of the need to think through the combination of the two. The definition of the state, second, the definition of the state role in higher education is specific to national history and national political culture. This shapes national variation in recognition of and understandings of public goods and also frames practices. Inevitably, public goods in Russian higher education are to some extent different to those that are possible and actual in Germany or the US or China. Now, this is more due to variations in the political aspect than in the economic aspect. The economic approach is more generic, I think, than the political approach to public and private. The extent to which we can devise a generic aspect of public goods in higher education, a common approach between nations, is something that I'll only be able to assess on the basis of a larger number of national case studies. Thank you. Thank you, Simon.